Hello and a very warm welcome to Mountain Springs Church Online. I'm Daniel. I serve on team here as Senior Pastor and you've joined us on a great day. Today we are kicking off a new series and today also we're going to be ending our message by taking the elements of communion together. So if you're a Jesus follower, I want to encourage you to go ahead and head to the kitchen at any point throughout this message and grab the elements, grab some bread, grab some juice, grab some wine. And together at the end of the message, we will take communion together. 2020, what a year, what a year. I remember now 10 years ago how churches and organizations alike look towards the year, the iconic year of 2020, as the branding year of their vision statements. Vision 2020, Mission 2020, See Clearly 2020, Clarity 2020. But yet how so, now that we're in 2020, how none of us had any idea how this year would turn out, where we thought it would be a year crowned with achievements, and vision procurement, it has turned out to be one of the disunifying and certainly one of the most divisive years in my lifetime. Every direction we turn now, there is strain, tension, and violence. And not one of us is excluded from this reality. Friendships are strained. Partnerships have been ruined. Organizations have been disrupted. And sadly, churches are being divided. Simple matters are now turning into volatile disagreements. Incidentally, do you remember the day where you could be friends with people who disagreed with you? Somehow and in some way this year, we have lost sight of the capacity to to disagree. And thus, Proverbs 27, I fear we are losing sight of the value of iron sharpening iron. Something needs to change And it's got to change fast. Well, what do we do? What can we do? What must we do? Well, on one side of things, I guess humorously speaking, we could grab, like Adam Sandler did in the movie Click, we could grab the remote and we could fast forward through time. I'm not sure if you've seen that movie. I incidentally haven't, but I know the premise. Adam Sandler, Click, grabs the remote and is able to fast forward through time. There is no one that I know right now, everybody it seems, would love to fast forward through the election and get to Thanksgiving morning, mm, football, pumpkin pie, turkey, a great day. But yet we don't have a click remote, so what can we do? We don't have the remote, so what is it that we can do? Well, in so many ways, human behavior is cyclical. And this is not the first time that we have experienced Such a cultural malaise, such a cultural sickness. In fact, one similar time is recorded in Scripture in Acts 11. So I want to encourage you, grab your Bibles this weekend, if you've got one close by, and turn with me to Acts chapter 11. For the next two weekends, we're going to go on a journey to a fractured society, to a broken city, but to a city that experiences a genuine move of God. That's what we need as a nation. That is what we need as a society is a genuine, authentic move of God to heal the division, to heal the broken nature and this cultural malaise that we live in. In. Let's pray together and we'll dig into the Word of God this weekend. God, we commit this message to you now. And we pray, Father, that we would realize this is our great opportunity. This is our opportunity to influence change, to invite your kingdom to come, to rule and reign in this land. We honor you and we bless you and speak, God, today to us through Acts 11. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. The city in question is Antioch, and if you will, give me a few moments to set the context for this city and for our primary text this weekend, where we're going to dig into verse 19 onwards in Acts 11. Following Stephen's martyrdom in Acts 7 and Saul's subsequent persecution in Acts 8, By the time we get to Acts 11, a significant dispersion of people has occurred. 
Many people have dispersed throughout all of the known ancient world at that time, many of whom have dispersed 300 miles north to the city of Antioch. At the time, Antioch was one of the most well-known cities in the Greco-Roman world, and it paled only to Alexandria and Rome in terms of significance in the empire. It hosted hundreds of thousands of people, and it was a commercial and a cosmopolitan hub. It was also rich in multiculturalism, Arabs and Persians and Phoenicians and Italians and Jews flooded the streets there in the city of Antioch. And yet, like many large cities at that time, the diversity and the sheer volume of people caused the city to divide along racial lines. As the lines were drawn, ethnic groups were established. And in all, history tells us that Antioch had 18 subgroups of people, clusters of people known as quarters. 18 subgroups of people. One of those quarters was known as the Jewish quarter. Some 25,000 Jews filled the Jewish quarter and it represented this strong magnet to pull all of the others leaving Jerusalem north into the city of Antioch. However, however, and this is a big however, as a large melting pot, tensions quickly rose. As so many cultures and so many subgroups of people converged on the small city, tensions rose and society splintered along skin color lines. And in no time at all, Antioch suffered public race riots. The tension spilled over the brink of the pot that was melting to where there was very real strain and division in the city. Rodney Stark, who wrote the book Cities of God, a fantastic read, says this, compared with even the most crime-prone modern cities, Antioch was overrun with crime. He goes on to say this, night fell over the city like a shadow of a great danger, diffused, sinister, and menacing. Everyone fled to his home, shut himself in, and barricaded the entrance. The shops fell silent. Safety chains were drawn behind the leaves of the door. This was not a great time to be alive. Residents of the city suffered nightly from the deviance and the disorder. Well, to make this city sound even more like 2020, the city suffered from a handful of virus epidemics to where it soared such to where mortality rates peaked over 25%. Well, Here are the reasons why we need to study this text. It's a massively important text for us, and I believe not only is it timely, not only is it important, I believe it's prophetic. I believe it's prophetic for the American church, because here's what's so stunning. In this broken society, fractured through racial lines, tiered through uh, socioeconomic lines, in this city, God birthed, an unstoppable church. And through the witness of the church, Antioch learned what love, reconciliation, and unity could look like. Now, let me say that to you again. Through the church, through this unstoppable church, Antioch, the city, realized what love, reconciliation, and unity could look like. In fact, it would be such a dynamic move of God that occurred there in the city of Antioch that historians, generations later, would look back upon Antioch and call it the cradle of Christianity. Call it the cradle of Christianity for three reasons. Number one, it was the location of the composition of Matthew's gospel. Number two, it was because this was the launching pad for Paul on his missionary journeys. And point number three, why was it called the cradle of Christianity? Because, because this was the first place that people were ever called Christians. They said they're not Greek, they're not Jew, they're not Gentile, they're not associated with some nationality, they're associated with some form of spirituality, and we'll call them little Christs. So, The primary text of the weekend, verse 19 of Acts 11. Let me read it to you this weekend. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21. 
And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And so a great many people were added to the Lord. Verse 25, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So what does this passage teach us in 2020? Antioch came to life through six spiritual steps. Six spiritual steps. We're going to get to the first three of them today, and then next weekend in our second and final message in this little mini-series, we'll look at the remaining three of them. First, and if you have your app open, I want to encourage you, go ahead and open it up if you haven't already, and start filling in some of these blanks. The first Most importantly, they prayed expectantly. They prayed expectantly. They brought their city to life through prayer. In the first 10 chapters of Acts, prayer is a central theme of the narrative. Acts 2.42, they were devoted to prayer. Acts 4.31, it says, when they had prayed, the place, I love this, was shaken. Come on now, it was shaken. Acts 6 verse 4, they say, we will devote ourselves to prayer. It was this degree of spiritual momentum that impacted and then spilled into the streets of Antioch. Kingdom breakthrough is always connected to those that pray. Our hearts have once again got to be stirred to pray for our lands. Two primary realms where I believe that we are called to pray. The first one is this, we must pray for peace in our cities. Jeremiah 29, 7 says this, Seek the peace of the city where I have sent you and pray. Pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its peace. You will have peace. God desires that our cities not be cities of turmoil, but cities of peace. Jesus would say to us this weekend, Matthew 10, 11 and 13, Whatever city you enter, let your peace come upon it. You know, often we can think of peace as the absence of tension, maybe peace as some form of tranquility. But yet when you grasp it biblically, peace is always more transformative than it is one of tranquility. Peace, shalom, the Hebraic word speaks about this shalom that implies this expansive wholeness. This expansive wholeness where shalom, the Hebraic word for peace, speaks about the righting of all wrongs, the restoration of biblical justice to where this expansive goodness is given and spread throughout a region. That's what we're called to do. When Jesus says, let your peace fall upon your city, or where Jeremiah says to those scattered into Babylon, pray for the peace of this place. What he is saying is, you're a vessel of peace. You're a vessel of shalom. We are, if we're a Jesus follower, we have been given the presence of God. We're the carriers of God's presence. And where we go, justice goes. And where we go, peace goes. And where we go, His presence goes. Conversely, where we do not go, One might even say the presence of God is not brought there in the personalized shalom way. Why? God works through holy people, not holy buildings. God works through holy people. It is shalom peace that our nation needs to move from deterioration to restoration, from decline to God's divine design. So we've got to pray for the peace of our cities. And we've got to offer and extend shalom to the brothers and sisters throughout our region that are looking to be accepted, to want to know that they matter, to want to know that they have a place where they can experience shalom, peace too. So first, we pray for peace in our cities. Point number two, really within this first idea, and that is second, we must pray for power in our churches. 
We've got to pray for power in our churches. Without prayer, there will never be power. Pete Gregg, the leader, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, friend of mine says it this way, I'm convinced that prayer is not only our greatest privilege, but also our greatest source to power. Antioch was transformed through spiritual power. Ultimately and undeniably, it was a move of the Holy Spirit that transformed Antioch. Now, friends, hear me. The church will emerge from this chapter known as 2020. This church, our church, the Big C Church, will emerge from this chapter known as the COVID chapter. And when we emerge, we have got to emerge with faith, power, and humility. But I fear to some degree now that the church might emerge from this chapter of 2020 as a weak movement distinguished by anger, opinion, and division. Now, speaking philosophically in so many ways, we have got drawn into the playground scuffles of opinion when we should have stepped onto the public square with repentance. Over this past year, the national conversation has been monopolized by the scientific voice and the secular voice. But where is the spiritual voice? Where is the spiritual voice speaking prophetically over our land? I believe that the church is to be the conscience of a nation. The church is to be the conscience of a nation. But are we? But are we? Or if we lost, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, have we lost our saltiness? And you know what he says, that the saltiness that has lost its taste, lost its power, it's discarded. We will emerge from this chapter, but I'm genuinely concerned that we are becoming more of a secularized voice than a prophetic spiritual voice. Rather than filling ourselves with opinions, we have got to fill our lives with the power of God and speak with the words of God, with the tone of the Holy Spirit. We have got to speak with more spiritual power. We have got to speak with more authority. The need for God's anointing to transform cities has arguably never been more necessary. In terms of practical application, this Tuesday night, I want to invite you to join us as a church and wherever you live, no matter what city or village or community you find yourself in, even right now, I want to invite you, would you pray this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock? Here in Colorado Springs this Tuesday, uh, the sun will set right around 7 o'clock. And as the sun sets over our city, I want us to pray for our city. No matter what city, village, or community you find yourself in, pray for the peace of that area. Pray for the shalom, the righting of all wrong, and pray. And I love this verse. This is our theme verse for this Tuesday night. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I urge, he says, that supplications, prayer, and intercession, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Let's pray for our government. Let's pray for our local leaders. That we, he says, pray so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it pleases God, in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, this is why we pray, because God desires that all people be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus, fall upon your church for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of our cities, for the sake of our communities and our neighborhoods, fall upon our church. Take out your schedule right now, maybe switch screens over and find there in your device your schedule and Tuesday night, 7 p.m., let's pray together. Well, prayer is a spiritual action. I believe that prayer should always call us and compel us towards some form of practical application. So much so, point two, second, they pioneered boldly. They transformed the city of Antioch because they pioneered boldly. Of those scattered, they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But, verse 20, underline this, there were some of them who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. 
Immersed in a broken society, they brought it to life through just a a handful of them. Antioch came to life through bold and prayerful people unwilling to settle that chose to step up. God's work always grows through those that are willing to say, I will stand up. Like those in the first century, this is a chapter of time where God has given us stewardship over this remarkable time. He has given us stewardship over this chapter. And we are called to step into this chapter. Talking with my wife this past week and sharing this with her, and she said to the Lord, yeah, I don't know if I wanted to be alive during this chapter of American history. And the Lord spoke to my wife and said, Laurie, you were made for this time. You were made for this time. Men and women, we were made for this time. God has given us stewardship over this time, but are we willing to step into it? Are we willing to step into it? Long before 2020, God had aligned and designed and prepared things for us to do this year. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Jesus for good works. Now, don't miss this parenthetically almost, which God prepared beforehand, comma, that we might walk in them. My great concern in this season is that we will miss this opportunity, that we'll miss this opportunity. Let's step into this opportunity. During all of the chaos of Antioch, during all of the relative chaos in America, Let's step into this opportunity. This is our great opportunity. Some people say things are gonna get worse and worse. And on some days I would agree with you and on other days I would say, well, let's fight. Here's what I would say to us today. I'd say if things do get worse and worse in our country, I'm not just gonna sit on the sidelines. I'm not just gonna join in the complaints. I'm not just gonna sit around and complain about this mess. Why? Because we're called to be change agents. We're called to step up, to be a people of hope. No negative person has ever transformed their city. No pessimistic person has ever planted a church. No fearful person has ever seen the work of God throughout their lives. We're called to be a people of hope that no matter how bad it gets, we're a people that say race, riots, epidemics, whatever, and I'm talking Antioch, but yet I could be talking about America, I will step up. We need a rise of prophetic speakers. We need a rise of gospel thinkers. We have enough grenade throwers. We need more prophetic speakers and gospel thinkers. If you're a counselor, counsel. If you're a singer, sing. If you're a dancer, dance. If you're a preacher, preach. If you're a leader, lead. If you're a server, serve. Why? This is the time. We were created for this chapter to bring order where there is chaos, to bring kingdom where there is a secular voice. We are to be the voice of reason and conscience for our nation. Let's lean into this opportunity. What new and restorative thing might you do? What simple Simple, just absolutely basic thing can you do that when you do it is just sprinkled by the Holy Spirit in such a way to change a region. City Serve is coming up October the 3rd and I want to tell you, we're going to be rolling up our sleeves as a church hundreds last year and I pray even more this year. We'll sign up and serve an October the 3rd City Serve event. I want to encourage you at the end of the message, Make a note, jump over on the app and sign up to serve with us and hundreds of others. Let's never underestimate the impact of a series of small acts in a city. Why? Because the future, I believe, the future belongs to those that will always respond to pain with empathy, hate with love, chaos with kindness. The future belongs to those that will respond to conflict by creating community. What I want you to hear this weekend is I want you to hear that this is who we are. This is our DNA. Christians have always throughout history stepped into the voids where there is chaos to bring shalom, kingdom, peace. Let's not be like the nation of Judah. The prophet Ezekiel spoke on behalf of God saying in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, I looked for a man and a woman among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And maybe you know the next few words, but I found 
none. God looked for someone to step up and stand in the gap, but he couldn't find one person. Friends, let's stand up. The last point I want to be brief as we close here this weekend. Number three, they preached fervently. They preached fervently. It says in verse 20 of Acts 11, of the son of them, they preached the Lord Jesus and the hand of the Lord, verse 21, was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Antioch changed and became the cradle of Christianity. Why? Because of the centrality of the gospel. There's another time later in the Acts narrative, and I'm not going to turn there, but I want to encourage you to look at it in Acts 19, verse 23, where Paul stumbles upon a riot of his own there in Ephesus. And I love this text. Why? Because Paul is like, put me in, coach. Put me in. I want to go in. I've got them all here together. Essentially, they have to physically restrain Paul from going into the middle of the riot. Why? Because he wanted to preach the gospel to them. And it just hit me. What kind of belief must we have, must Paul have had to say, I want to go in because all that they need is the gospel to break up this chaos. Friends, let's speak life into our city. There is undeniable transformative power in the gospel when it's preached clearly and when it's lived humbly. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Let's not accommodate our approach to this age. Let's not dilute the gospel to make it more tolerable or palatable because it is disgusting when we delight in what we dissolve or dilute the beauty of the gospel. Let's stand upon it. And I want to leave you with this one thought as we prepare to go into the elements of communion. So I want to encourage you, grab them as we prepare to take the elements together. I love what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, it's this image of a bell, like a bell ringing, and it just has waves throughout a region for you in Macedonia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. There is a principle here, and the principle is that the reputation of a church can be known throughout a region. Men and women, let's not be known for inaction. Let's not be known for opinion. Let's be known because we have heralded the gospel and we have unleashed the kingdom of God. I believe that this passage is prophetic and next week we'll build more upon this text. Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 speaks about the Lord's Supper. And he says, when you take of this bread and when you take of this cup, you are committing to proclaim the death of Jesus Christ until He returns. As we close out this first message in this mini-series, I thought it'd be so rich for us to take of the elements together. I want to encourage you, go ahead and hold up the bread now. If you're a Jesus follower, let's hold up the bread together. God, I pray that as we take of this bread together, God, I pray that even through modern technology, the, the beauty and the symbolism of being unified in this one act, as we take of the bread together, we do commit to preach of the gospel until you return. Let's take the bread together. And Jesus, thank you for this cup, this, this cup, this wine, this juice that is representative of spilled blood for the sacrifice to be paid, for the price to be paid, for our lives to be purchased. Thank you that through this blood we are forgiven. You forgive us through the spilling of innocent blood that we the guilty might go free through grace. God, thank you for this juice. Let's take the drink t together. As we close, I want to leave you with this one thought that God indeed birthed the global movement from among the ruins of a broken society. And I believe that He can do it again. We need Him to do it again. We need God to move through our land, but He won't just do it through someone else. He wants to do it through you, through me. And He wants us to be faithful to say, even now in the 21st century of America, we want to see a move of God like first century Antioch. God, we pray that we would be a people that would say this is our great opportunity and we would step into it. We would step up to that plate 
and we would make a difference for the kingdom and for the glory of God. In your name we pray. Amen.